Welcome. Um, we are here today to discuss local innovations as a response to low commodity price. And what do we mean by that? We're talking about state and regional governments, districts and municipalities. What are the different channels through which local areas are being impacted by this global commodity price volatility? And what are the different ways they're responding to it, right? Both at the national level and at the subnational level. Different ways to prevent this, but also to mitigate this. And to discuss this further, we have a diverse set of panelists here from different parts of the world. And before I, I go ahead and introduce them, just to briefly uh, mention what the format of the presentations are. We will have 10 minutes presentation by each of our panelists, and then I'd like to go on and open it up for discussion. And I'm going to be quite strict about the, the, the 10 minutes that e each of you have. So without much ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Cielo. Cielo Magno is an assistant professor in the University of Philippines School of Economics. She's also the national coordinator for Bante Kita, which is the Publish What You Pay Coalition in Philippines. Dr. Cielo. Good morning, everyone. When Varsha emailed me to talk about um, price volatility and impact of, mine, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, impact of mining to the Philippines, I was uh, a little bit hesitant because when we're talking crisis at the international level, in the Philippines, we're not actually experiencing crisis. Um, we can see the, the graph on the left shows you investment in mining. It went down in 2012, but it's not because of the price cycle. It went down because we had moratorium in issuing mining licenses. But in 2013, it expanded while we still have moratorium. Investment in the sector increased. So it's moving against the, the price cycle. And why is that? One hypothesis that we have is because we have actually very low effective tax rate. So it allows companies to continuously operate even with a decline in price at the global level. We're also taking advantage of the um, policies that Indonesia is implementing right now. So taking advantage of the nickel demand of China and now becoming one of the biggest suppliers of nickel to, to China. So, but I'm not saying that this is a good recommendation to keep companies afloat. Don't ask me how this policy is affecting the sustainable development of the, of the country. In fact, at the national level, the effect of mining is very, very minimal. Uh, GDP contribution of mining to the Philippines is less than 1%. Okay? And I'm sure that if we have a crisis in the Philippines, it will make all the environmentalists happy if we close all mining operations. But uh, nevertheless, we have to assess the vulnerability of communities to mining operations. We know that mining companies leave a deeper footprint than other industrial, compa industrial in, uh, companies. So we have to make sure that communities are protected. So using data from EITI, we looked at how companies are uh, contributing to the revenue at the provincial level. And as you can see, it's also not that significant. Only for one island where uh, five mining companies are operating, the impact of the national wealth share to local government is actually worth around less than 5%. So in terms of revenue, even if we have a crisis, crisis it's not going to have a significant effect at the provincial level. So we look at the municipal level, and here we can actually see the possibility of having significant impact. Because in some areas, the contribution to revenue ranges from 25 to 40%. And imagine that mining company closing and losing half of the budget of the local government, that will have a significant effect in terms of providing basic services. In addition, using the EITI data, because the way we're implementing EITI in the Philippines is it's not just a disclosure and checking of the payments of companies to government, but we disclose all this information that are relevant at the local level. So we demanded companies to also disclose 
the level of uh, the number of employees at the local level. So based on the information, these are the companies that disclose their the number of employees. And as you can see, it's not really a lot. We also have no downstream industry in the Philippines. So if companies close, we have we still have a number of unemployment, but not that significant. Another issue that's that's important to raise is that not being overly optimistic about increasing investment in the Philippines, we also have experiences in um, abandoning, abandonment of mines. In fact, we have 33 mines in the Philippines that are now abandoned, and we cannot close them, and they're not rehabilitate, rehabilitated. So talking about social learning, it's important to anticipate what will be the impact of a mine closure to a community. So given all these scenarios, We've actually started advocating for a subnational EITI implementation in the Philippines. But as I said, we're going beyond just disclosure of uh, financials. We're looking at EITI more as a form of governance at the local level. It's a multi-stakeholder venue to discuss other issues aside from for the finances and actually utilize all this information to give opportunity for civil society to engage in natural resource management. There. So aside from disclosure of taxes and fees, in the Philippines, because of social learning, and we anticipated that uh, companies can close, we have uh, provisions requiring companies to actually set up funds for rehabilitation. In the first EITI report, we required companies to disclose whether these funds actually exist. Companies are required to set up this rehabilitation fund from the very beginning, even before they started operating. So in the first EITI report, we see whether these um, funds actually exist. Are they in separate account? Who's man managing the funds and how are they being utilized? By having this uh, report, we can now anticipate that if companies close, we now have funds to make sure that these areas will be rehabilitated. So that's one use of the national EITI report at the subnational level. Hmm. <laughs> it doesn't want to move. Wait, hold on. There. Multi-stakeholder governance. So aside from just disclosing financials, we're looking at it as an opportunity to discuss further other issues at the local level. Again, as I said, when we implemented EITI in the Philippines, we went beyond the minimum requirements. So we actually disclosed contracts. And aside from, just, aside from disclosing contracts, we required companies and governments to disclose all the auxiliary rights attached to uh, mining operation. And that includes the rights to use water, the rights to clear forests, the rights to use land. And through a multi-stakeholder group at the subnational level, we're using this opportunity to actually monitor if companies are complying with national regulation. So this is the idea that we are pushing to do at the subnational level. Another thing is local economic development. So I, I've shown you that uh, transfer to subnational units are very minimal at the provincial level, quite significant at the municipal level. But in the Philippines, social development um, ex uh, expenditure for companies are also mandatory. They're required to allocate 1.5% of their operating costs for social development. But we all know in most cases, companies use this as a, a tool to improve their political acceptability. But as far as we're concerned, we're also looking at this as a uh, public money because they're reporting it as cost. It's reducing um, corporate income tax due to companies. So therefore, it has to be uh, part of the accountability and transparency mechanism at the local level. And one strategy to mitigate the impact of uh, mine closure would be to utilize this um, social trust fund and make sure that there's equitable use of the fund, not just in target areas where mining companies need political acceptability, but make sure that there's equity in using the fund. So what we're trying to do is actually link the use of the fund to local economic development. So each local governments would have to develop their local economic development agenda and ask companies to fund and spend money for this local economic development agenda. Economic diversification, and I think we've been hearing this since yesterday. And how are we doing this at the local level? We know that um, at the local level, there are other economic activities being impacted by mining. 
And the more important thing is to be able to utilize the money that's coming from mining to support other sector. In the Philippines, if you look at poverty, the poorest sector would be the farmers and the fisher folks. So if we want to be able to address poverty and have a more sustainable impact at the local level, we have to make sure that the proceeds from mining would also benefit the other sector, including the farmers and the fisher folks. So given the multi-stakeholder forum, we are encouraging different stakeholders to actually discuss and uh, innovate on how we're going to use the money to also benefit other sector. And local trust fund. The problem with the Philippines right now is that we have budgeting requirements that require local governments to spend the money allocated to them within a year or two. If you're not able to spend it, you have to return it to the national government. So at the municipal level, imagine having a large company operating and transferring a huge amount of money from the shared national wealth. That will be a, a windfall for the local government. But because of this policy of requiring local governments to spend all the money, there's no planning, there's no uh, long-term uh, vision on how to utilize the money, and there's no um, intergenerational use of the fund. So as part of the advocacy of the group, we are asking the national government to allow local governments to actually create funds so that they can smoothen the use of the money. It's not necessarily a sovereign wealth fund, but just to allow local government to have savings so that they don't have to spend all the money in a year or two. So basically, what we're trying to do in the Philippines is that to go beyond transparency and accountability. We know that EITI has given us a strong foundation in terms of engagement, but as, as, as was said yesterday, it's important to bring it further and make sure that it provides space for civil society to talk about governance and engage in natural resource management. Thank you. Thank you, TLO, and, and thank you for keeping to time. Um, and it's really interesting you brought up the idea of the fund uh, at the end and, and, and the restrictions from the national government on uh, spending all the money versus the ability to save it. And I think that's a good segue to our next presentation by Aji. Aji Suleiman is an Indonesian regulatory specialist uh, working in the field of public administration law and institutional governance. He's the co-founder and managing director of Concilium Law and Public Policy. And he's also currently working with us at NRGI on uh, setting up a subnational fund in Bojonegoro district in Indonesia. Ajit. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I've been asked to share uh, my experience in dealing with one of the projects that we have with NRGI in one uh, small uh, oil-rich district in Indonesia. It's called Bojonegoro, and try to share the lesson learned and all the uh, experience that we can gather from that activities. But before that, I would like to provide the more a gener a general and uh, broader framework of the issue of subnational uh, revenue sharing in Indonesia. So, uh, if you if you attended uh, the presentation of my colleague Pak Faisal Basri yesterday, uh, you would remember that he was saying that because of the lower price uh, of the falling price, Indonesia is actually doing okay because at this moment it's a it's a net importing oil country and it's, it, it, it is still resource rich, it's still oil rich, but it's not that dependent anymore on research, uh, on resource and natural resources. But at the same time, there are still several uh, districts or regions, subnational regions in Indonesia that is still highly dependent on uh, oil revenue, which makes them very vulnerable and prone to volatility and also uh, all the negative impact of uh, mismanagement of natural resources. So having this in mind, there are several ideas being discussed here at the policy level and at, at the, the legislative level on how to provide an innovation, uh, especially uh, the financial innovation, setting up institutional governance to secure and mitigate the, the volatility of the natural resources. And 
And then I would like then to discuss about the specific case that we are currently working on in Bojonegoro, which is a voluntary initiative to save some of the fund for future generation and intergenerational equity. But at the same time, that is not that, that easy because Indonesia is still a, a, it is a unitary country that has a, a, a framework set out by the national government with the national regulation, which makes it more difficult to, to have a subnational innovation. And yeah, it's, 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 it's going to be the main challenge of, the, of, of this project. And finally, what are the lessons that we can uh, gather and uh, uh, capture from the, from the activities? So uh, this is the structure of the Indonesian uh, state budget, the revenue of the Indonesian state budget. Uh, as you can see that it's mostly, uh, the revenue is dominated by tax, uh, 114 billion and around 20 billion from the uh, non-tax. And out of the tax revenue, it's still uh, dominated by the v uh, VAT, value added tax, and income tax for non-oil and gas. So both comprise around 90 million, whereas the income tax from oil and gas is around eight, uh, sorry, 3.8 billion US dollar. But of course, in the income tax for non-oil and gas also includes other natural resources such as mining, fisheries, and forestry. Whereas the, I'm having the same problem. <laughs> Okay. Is it? Okay. Okay. So, uh, whereas the non-tax revenue consists of, uh, uh, for example, the dividend of state-owned enterprise and also public service revenue and oil and gas and natural resources uh, quite dominated the non-tax revenue. So, if, if you if you take together all of these uh, revenue from natural resources and we take into account VAT and also income tax from non-oil and gas, but from resource revenue for we can say that perhaps a give and take around 15 to 20 percent of the Indonesian revenue comes from natural resource revenue. But at the same time, uh, Indonesia has been experiencing from a massive decentralization for the last uh, 16 years. So uh, if you see uh, the total spending of the state budget of Indonesia, around 32 percent of the development spending goes to the uh, subnational transfer which is to the provincial level and also the district level. And it is distributed in various different schemes. There is a general allocation fund, which is in the form of block grant. Also a special allocation fund, which is to fund central project that is to be executed by the local government. And there's a revenue sharing fund. It's for tax and natural resource revenue. And this is based on origin and actual revenue, which means that only the region that produce natural resources or gathers tax will receive uh, more sharing of the fund and it's based on the actual revenue that, is, that the central government actually receives. Uh, okay, apologize for that. Oops. Okay, so this is a, an example of uh, oil and gas uh, revenue sharing based on uh, Minister of Finance stipulation. So there are, there are regions that receive uh, a substantial amount of revenue because they are the oil producing region in, in the country. So uh, that is the, basically the, the general context of Indonesia. So at, at, on one hand, the central government is beginning to have less dependence on natural resource revenue, but on the other hand, some resource-rich uh, districts in Indonesia still highly depend on uh, natural resource revenue. So I would like to address our attention to one specific case, and uh, I would like to have some uh, lesson from, from, this, from the project that we're currently having is in Bojonegoro. So this is, a, this is a budget uh, of Bojonegoro, the revenue budget of Bojonegoro in 2015. As you can see, it's the revenue sharing from natural resource and tax comprise 41% of the revenue of the, of, the, of the district. And this is, this is a small district. I can say that the budget total revenue is only 229 million, so it's not a very big district. But yeah, it, it comprises 41% 40, 40, of which comes from natural resources, and 30% is uh, special, uh, the general transfer from the uh, central government. So they are very uh, highly dependent on central government. But actually, this is not all, because if you look at the structure of the revenue, natural resource revenue at the district level in Indonesia, there is basically two main sources. Well, there are there are other sources, but. Uh, the main sources would be two, which is first would be the revenue transfer from the central government, which is that 41% and 30%. Uh, 
And there is also a, a, a participating interest in which the local government is entitled to have 10% stake uh, through the local state-owned company to actually uh, participate and contribute capital in the, in the, in the oil project. And it's, it belongs to the local government. But at this moment, it's still zero because uh, uh, it, it has not received the revenue yet, the dividend yet from the project, so it's still zero. So, uh, in respect to the volatility and the lower, lower price of uh, oil uh, in, the, in, in the global market, uh, there has been uh, some changes in the estimation. Uh, like, for example, the revenue sharing is expected to be uh, to, to reduce up to 60% because of falling price. So Bojonogoro will, will, will lose around 60% of the revenue sharing, revenue, uh, revenue sharing from the natural resource. Uh, and at the same time, that, that, that would be the projection for 2016. And projection for 2018, uh, like, uh, like uh, I mentioned before, at, at, at the moment, the, the dividend from the local project is currently zero. But it's going to increase quite substantially because around 2018, according to the projection, they were, the, this, this participating interest revenue will comprise of around 25% of the budget of Kojunogoro. So again, it, 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 the, the revenue from uh, oil and gas activities in this district is becoming uh, more and more significant and the, the district is becoming more dependent on uh, resource revenue while at the same time it becomes more fragile and volatile to uh, price changes. So, Given this context in mind, there are several discussions for innovation that is currently being uh, pursued, currently being uh, advocated. Uh, but let me give you a context in a broader context in the, in the national level. Because uh, at the national level, uh, Indonesia is a net oil importer, and we have a beginning to lower, uh, have a diminished lower producing capacity, and there's a demand to utilize uh, the new wells and old wells. But at the same time, there's also subnational uh, issues in which uh, some region becomes more dependent on subnational uh, resource revenue. And also, uh, there's a problem of wasteful spending and also decentralized corruption, which if you, if, you, if you follow my colleague's presentation yesterday, it has been discussed. So what is the innovation in both, uh, in both structures? So in the, in the national level, there has been a discussion to set up a national petroleum fund which is not actually a sovereign, sovereign wealth fund, but it's more of a fund to, to fund new exploration activities and also to fund the development of, the, of, of old, uh, old wells. While at the same time, at, at the subnational level, there has been a discussion to set aside the revenue that is received by the local government, and they use it to save it for the, for the later generation to promote intergenerational equity. But of course, the problem is that why would the local government want to save this money if they can spend it for development? Is there any way for the central government to impose this, this, this obligation? Because at, because at the end of the day, what, what belongs to this local subnational region is their, is their right and they can use whatever they want with that as long as it's within the, the regulatory framework. So after some discussion with some of the regions and some of the stakeholders on this issue, there has been several ideas, like for example, uh, saving fund on top of the resource transfer. So basically, the, the the local government say that okay, I want to save, but I don't want to save from my from from my portion. You give me more, and I will save from that additional revenue that you give me. So it's like a saving fund on top of the transfer. Or there's even a discussion on matching fund. So for example, if the subnational regional government wants to save 10 then the central government will give also additional 10. So in that way, it creates incentives for the uh, subnational governments to save the money for, yeah, for uh, future generation. But this is something that requires legislative and regulatory amendments. So this is something that's still at the policy discussion. So uh, what we, when we talk about imposing a mandatory saving for the subnational government, it is difficult and it requires, uh, it requires uh, a change in the legislation. In the case of Bojonogoro, which is the, which is the uh, district we're currently working on, it's not mandatory, but it's a voluntary initiative, actually. They have, a set, they have set a target. They, they want to save 100 million in the next 25 years, so they would save around 2.5 billion in the next 25 years, and it should, be a, it should be a lockbox, so they're not going to use the money, but all the yield of the investment can be used to finance social development projects. It may not be a, a, a proper sovereign wealth fund as we ideally know it, but it's something that 
something we're trying to compromise. Why? Because of course this is still a unitary country. Uh, there, are there are still national regulatory for frameworks that we need to comply with, that we need to adhere to. And it's not that easy. Like for example, if, we, if, if, if the district saves too much, would it be considered as inefficient development spending? And it, is not, it, it may not be used for stabilization because that would be the domain of the central government, but it's merely for saving. And this is number three, is a very crucial, inform uh, very crucial issue or concern. Like for example, if you, if you make a bad investment in this uh, natural resource fund, would it be considered as corruption? Because the definition of corruption in Indonesia is very broad, is very wide. Any commercial failure or uh, commercial, uh, the fail of uh, business activities can be considered as, cor as corruption and this uh, creates problem with the whoever is going to manage this fund. And also, how to survive uh, political leadership because this, is, this, this, this idea proposal belongs to, happens to be one uh, a visionary leader, but what happens if that, if that leader is, is going to, replace, uh, to be replaced in the future? So it, this is something, this is issues that we've been facing. And also, uh, at the end of the day, would the subnational governments require approval or clearance from the central government? And yeah, this is something that we're currently been working on. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it, it, it stressed out the importance of transparency in this issue. Uh, why? Because like, like we mentioned before, there are, there are, there are two sources of there are two sources of revenue, natural resource revenue, which is the transfer from central government and also the participating interest. Uh, with respect to resource transfer, subnational region is actually a taker. They're not a giver. So they really depend on central government and they, wa they, want, they demand more transparency from the central government of the calculation of the transfer fund. Whereas for the participating interest of the 10% that belongs to the subnational government, Theoretically, this is something that the subnational government can control because they have that 10%, they own it, but sometimes they don't have the money to inject capital, so they have some, some creative financing structure, they borrow money that is off the book, that is not subject to public information disclosure, which makes us, which makes us easy, uh, more difficult to have information disclose who's the ownership, the structure of the fund, which, uh, which makes it difficult to forecast how much exactly the revenue that the subnational government would receive from the participating interest. So, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, to wrap up the issues, uh, in the absence of national regulatory framework, I think the, the problem with subnational innovation would be the first one, is, it mo is the model sustainable? Because it would, it would need to survive change of political leadership. Is the local institution capable, given that most of the regulatory authority is still within the central government? And finally, is the model replicable? Because this is a voluntary initiative, and there is no region that wants to launch this voluntary initiative other than one district we are currently working on. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, Indonesia at the national level is growing dependence on crude oil. Uh, at the national level, but at the same time, the idea of saving for future generation is more relevant at the subnational level, and that's why innovation should be made at the subnational level. But it is not that easy to impose that, that this structure because it is not mandatory, and that's why voluntary initiatives should be appreciated, like the one that uh, we have in Bojonogoro. And transparency is something that is important, and it's, it, it creates uh, an interesting and strategic alliance between the subnational authorities and civil society because they both demand the same thing, which is transparency from the central government. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aji. I think that was a, a very interesting presentation on a, on a unique model, and I'm sure there'll be questions and, and comments on that. And I think the slide you had at the end on some of the, the broader questions on sustainability and replicability and, and role of central government is, is something we, we need to uh, unpack further. Uh, and next, we have uh, Fabio Velasquez. He's a sociologist and director of Foro Nacional por Colombia. Thank you very much, uh, Varsha, for the invitation. I'd like to say two points, two previous points to contextualize the, the Colombian case. Uh, first, uh, oil and coal are two main, the two main products of Colombia's export basket. 
the country is the fourth largest oil producer in Latin America and the largest producer of coal <coughs> in the region. Uh, the exploitation of these resources takes place in several regions uh, of the country in which the extractive industry is the main economic activity. And that is important to know the, the big impact of the low prices of commodities. Uh, secondly, uh, the Colombian constitution defines the country as a unitary, decentralized and participatory republic with autonomy of subnational governments. Uh, but despite this definition, the management of the extractive sector is highly centralized. Uh, as a result, uh, uh, subnational government is not actively involved in managing the sector, except in two respects. First, the collection of some local taxes to companies, and secondly, uh, the investment of royalties in local development projects. Local taxes do not represent a high percentage of the budget of municipalities and departments. In contrast, royalties constitute a significant proportion of the budget, especially in small towns and in regions with a weak local economic base, uh, approximately 25 to 30 percent of the budget. Uh, what has been the response of the various stakeholders to the falling uh, in prices? The government has, the national government, has implemented several strategies, four strategies. First, a tax reform to cover the fiscal deficit created by the future reduction of revenues from extractive industries. Uh, secondly, it has increased its stagnant debt in order to supplement the resources for social investment and infrastructure. Third, it has promoted, in the case of oil, the exploration of new wells through conventional and unconventional methods uh, in order to increase crude oil reserves. And finally, it tries to facilitate a series of tax and, and administrative incentives for private investors to compensate the lower prices with increased production. For their part, companies, both in the oil and the mining sectors, have expressly asked the government to define new tax incentives to man maintain the investment in the country and to avoid large-scale redundancies of workers in their companies. However, despite the announcement from the mining and oil sector guilds stating that there would be no layoff in the short term, the oil company Pacific Rubiales has recently begun to reduce the number of workers at its facility in Puerto Gaitan, uh, the main oil producing region in Colombia. So the first impact has to do with the local employment. Workers' companies fear losing their jobs, as has already begun to happen, and experience great uncertainty about the future of the medium and long term, as their ability to continue working in the companies depends on invest decisions made by these companies and state policies at national and local level. Similarly, local communities living in the producing regions have begun to feel the impact of lower prices uh, on the local economy, not only in terms of job creation, but also other benefits linked to the presence of companies for instance, through corporate social responsibility programs. But there is another channel of impacts, the revenue share, sharing. Also, the volume of royalties has not fallen in the national aggregate. The amount was mu multiplied by six in nominal terms between 205 and 2014. Royalties did lose their weight as a share of the total budgets of subnational governments and fell in absolute, uh, in absolute terms to producer municipalities. This was due to the reform of the royalty distribution system in 2011 that changed the share of uh, direct and indirect royalties. In 2010, the royalties uh, accounted for 88% of all royalties. In 2014, only, uh, account only for 21% and the royal, and direct royalties were uh, distributed among all municipalities and departments in the country. This has forced the subnational governments, especially in the producing regions, to drastically cut their investment programs, which not only has social impact on quality of life, but also political and electoral impacts on the legitimacy, legitimacy of local governments. 
The new royal system created two funds to distribute portion of uh, indirect royalties between municipalities and departments, a development fund and a compensation, compensation fund for the poorest region. Uh, however, most of the subnational governments have deficit of institutional capacity for project management, which is a barrier for them to access these funds. Last year, for example, there was sub-implementation of these revenues in some regions of the country due to lack of projects for, from municipalities and departments. Some subnational governments have raised the need to increase local taxes to offset the decline of royalties. Companies have reacted against that measure since they consider that this increases the, their cost in a time of falling prices. In their opinion, this would, lead, uh, this would lead to uh, them to look for other places to, inver to invest or stay there, but reducing employment and productive investments. But these cases have been exceptional. Most municipalities have requested more investment from the central government in their territory to meet the goals of their development plans. It is noteworthy that very few subnational governments are planning to implement productive diversification strategies in their territory to uh, reduce the dependence of extractive activities. In the Department of Chocó, in the Colombian Pacific, we are developing, uh, together with the subnational government, a policy of clean gold production accompanied by reforestation work and promoting agriculture as a complementary activity to mining. We are promoting the same policy in other regions of the country where mining has become the dominant activity in the region. But it, it is also exceptional in the country. Now I want to, uh, to pose five measures that can contribute in the future to reduce the effect of lower prices. First, the implementation of subnational EITI experiences within the framework of the initiative of the, at the national level. In the multi-stakeholder committee, we approved the proposal to carry out the experience in some regions of the country, which would allow transparency and of payments and revenues at that level. I think that the experiences of the Philippines and Peru are relevant to get information about the lesson learned in this regard. Number two, the government recently implemented a project of royalties map that provides information about ongoing projects with resources from royalties. There are still some problems of uh, rela uh, reliability of the information, but this is an instrument that will help the investment of revenues to have a greater impact on the territory and, this, and its population. Third, another measure is creating incentives for productive diversification in the subnational level and to prevent labor from migrating uh, from agriculture sector to the mining sector. This will allow tax diversification at the subnational level and reduce fiscal dependence on destructive industries. Four, strengthening civil society to monitor the use of royalties and its impact on quality of life in the regions. A more active and present citizenship in the management of revenues from extractive activity is necessary. This reduces the risk of corruption and contribu contributes to a more efficient use of revenues. Currently, there are some participation instruments for this monitoring in Colombia, but they are generally too weak as a scenarios for citizen participation. And finally, it is necessary to build governance agreements or pacts in the regions through which different sectors, local government, companies, small miners, social organizations, and political leaders build a shared vision of the territory in which a specific weight is assigned to the extractive industries and other productive activities, and guidelines are given to the local government on the appropriate use of public revenues. These measures involve a change at the management of the extractive sector but they can help improve the level of governance of the sector and solve some problems, in particular mistrust amongst actors, especially between companies and communities, and tensions between the national government and subnational authorities in decision-making related to the extractive sector. 
and synthesis, we, we need not only technical arrangements, but also political solutions. We need more democracy in the territory, more dialogue, conversation between social, economical, and political actors. Uh, for me, that is the principal point. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, next, I'm extremely pleased to welcome Zainab. Uh, Zainab Ahmed is the Executive Secretary of the Nigeria EITI and is known nationally and internationally for the transformative role she's played there. Previously, she was the Chief Finance Officer of the Nigeria Mobile Telecommunications Limited. Zainab. Good afternoon, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have been invited to contribute to this topic, and because we work with the EITI, we're centering our contribution based on some of the work that NAITI in Nigeria has done that uh, covered the subnational governments. Nigeria is currently the largest economy in Africa with a GDP of 510 billion US dollars. The oil and gas industry contributes 15% to the Nigeria's GDP. Nigeria is a rentier state. It depends very heavily, up to 80% of its uh, budget is contributed by the oil revenues from the oil and gas sector. The, the, the states also consequently depend on monthly share of oil revenue for their subnational operations. Overdependence on oil and gas revenues has led to neglect of sectors by the states of, uh, for internally generated uh, revenue. Nigeria is one of the uh, earliest starters in the EITI uh, implementation. And uh, as a federation, we have uh, the center that holds a lot of power and 36 states of the federation with 776 local governments. On a monthly basis, all the revenue that accrues to the Federation is pulled into um, a pool that we call the Federation account and is shared on a monthly basis. The ratio of the sharing is 52.6% to the federal level and 26.72% to the states and 20.6% to the local government levels. This picture just shows how much dependent Nigeria is on the oil and gas revenues Every month, the revenues that accrue are shared. When there is a, a surplus, in, when, when the oil price is, is high, uh, the excess between the budgeted amount and what is realized is uh, saved in an excess crude account. But the excess crude accounts in Nigeria has been poorly managed to the extent that now it's uh, the amount is so low that it's not sufficient to cushion the effect of the price fall on both the federal and the, the state governments. The revenue sharing for formula is defined in the Constitution, and this is a picture that shows how the, both the mineral and non-mineral revenues are, are shared to the various tiers of government. Of uh, special interest here is that there is a proportion of the revenues from the oil and gas industry that goes to the, 13, the, the nine states that are, responsible, that, that are responsible for the generation of the oil and gas revenue. So 13% of the revenues from the oil and gas go to the nine states where the operations of the industry um, happen. The report we are using to present the case of the subnational uh, government management of funds is an audit that NAITI conducted following the EITI principles and, uh, and standards. We call it the physical allocation and statutory disbursement audits. In this uh, first audit, we selected nine states as a pilot, and the selection was to reflect the uh, six geopolitical zones, but also uh, states that are producing oil and states that are also that are not producing oil. 
The objective of the audit was to establish how extractive industry revenues was distributed from, by the various tiers of government. It was also to examine how the funds are utilized by the various tiers of government. And it was to establish uh, the transparency and accountability uh, and the processes that are followed. The essence of the whole of this is to provide information to the citizens to be able to hold governments at various levels to account. While the audit covered states, it was also, uh, it also covered some special funds that the Federation has, such as the um, Stabilization Fund, the Natural Resource uh, Development Fund, the NDDC, which is a corporation that is set up to provide um, development uh, to the Niger Delta region. But for this uh, meeting of today, we are only presenting some of the information regarding the states. One of the states we selected is Aqua Ibom State. It is one of the uh, states that has the richest oil deposits in its region. And uh, the analysis that we did showed that while River States gets a lot of revenue every month up to about 1.45 trillion, this is almost about 10 billion US dollars over the reported period, it was spending most of its money for administrative <coughs> expenses. Of the capital uh, uh, funding that it had, it spent up to about 24% on administrative expenses, and specifically, there was a building of uh, a government house that took a lot of the resources of the, of the state. Nasara State, on the other hand, is one of the states in the Federation that earns the least amount of revenues. And um, the revenues it earns is such that, both from the Federation and internally generated revenue, that it has to borrow every month to be able to cover its operations. It relied heavily on loans and grants from donors to, to bridge its funding gap. The internally generated revenue of Nasara State is a mere 7% of the total revenue that it gets on a monthly basis, and it spends also very heavily on recurrent expenditure as opposed to capital expenditure that is required for sustainable economic growth. Kano State, on the other hand, Amongst the state we, we chose had within the park the highest um, internally generated revenue, 24% of its revenues was internally generated. But also the picture was Kano also had more spending on recurrent expenditure as opposed to capital expenditure. River State is the state that earns the second highest revenues from the oil and gas industry in, in the country, and uh, it's it spent up to 36% of its revenue on the environmental sector, which is a good thing, but um, it also has very, very little internally generated revenue. The impact of uh, for the states that have low internal generated revenue is that with the price of um, um, crude oil falling, that they are going to have very significant difficulties in operating within the state. Bielsa State had the least IGR in the park at 3%. Bielsa State, we had seen during the course of the audit, actually borrows to um, borrows on a uh, on a monthly basis to cover its operational deficit. We also covered Ondo State. Ondo State had also a low IGR of uh, 8%. Imo State also had very low IGR and its social spending, which is supposed to be um, the economic sector, um, is, was just uh, placed at 2%. The consequences of over-dependence on oil revenue for the states is that with the dwindling revenues coming from the center, that the states are placed in a position of poor capacity to meet their developmental objectives. These states that have sampled are all of them heavily dependent on oil and gas revenue. The states are 
heavily indebted and are seeking currently for bailout from the federal government. And the federal government has responded by stating that the states have to first of all put in place some adequate fiduciary arrangements because it is concerned that even if it provides a bailout, the money is provided will go the same way the previous resources have been used. The current debt of um, the states is about 3.3 billion, and this does not include external debt. And what this means is that for some states, their debt service obligations on a monthly basis is more than their internally generated um, revenues. Options that we think can be looked at for addressing some of the challenges by the states include a deliberate policy on sector reforms within the states. States need to uh, refocus on developing their internally generated revenue. There is no state in the Federation that does not have rich mineral deposits. There is very high potential for developing agriculture. Some of that is happening already. And the states must concentrate on the, um, providing infrastructure and social services so that enterprises can thrive and, uh, and, and growth, uh, sustainable growth can be assured for the citizens. Then there is a need for the states to create an incentive for citizens to pay tax. As it is, because money is um, distributed every month at the center, the citizens don't really feel an obligation to, to pay tax uh, to, to the state. Um, because of all of the wastages, people feel, why should I pay tax when I don't see uh, the resources that are currently being uh, provided being put to, to good use? So there's a need for governments at this state level to provide incentives for citizens to, to pay tax. And there's also a need to strengthen the public accountability laws and also for uh, the continuation of this type of audits that NAITI has started to provide the public with information that they can use to uh, hold government to account. That's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. I think we heard a super interesting set of um, experiences and from different parts of the world. On the one hand, we see impact in Philippines, where there's hardly any impact at the national level. In fact, the only impact you have is positive through the direct channels. And at the same time, you see at the local level, there's mine closures and employment being lost and direct taxes going down at the district level. On the other end of the spectrum, you have revenue sharing. And I noticed that all the panelists we have here have come from countries that do have some degree of revenue sharing. In some countries, such as Indonesia and Nigeria, the, the subnational jurisdictions are highly dependent on revenue sharing. And in other cases, just Philippines, it's, it's, less, the, it's less the case. And so that seems to be the main channel through which international volatility in commodities is, is getting transmitted into subnational budget volatility. And what are the kind of innovations to respond to this? It, it, I, I don't know if I'm being um, dismissive if I were to say, or controversial, if I were to say perhaps the optimum solution would be to not have uh, certain forms of revenue sharing, and it'll be interesting to discuss that option. But moving beyond that, in the cases where revenue sharing does exist, there seems to be some attempt in Colombia and in the case of Nigeria to diversify, to look into more of own source revenues. Uh, in the case of Indonesia, it's a, an, a, as I mentioned earlier, I am not aware of any other unitary country where there is an attempt to set up a stabilization savings fund at the district level. And some of the questions RG posed at the end in terms of sustainability of such a model and replicability, not just outside the country, but within the country, given some of the governance challenge we've been hearing about in some of the previous sessions are, are, are really interesting. 
And then finally in the Philippine session, we were talking more about EITI. Despite not having a huge impact at the national level, Philippines has been really pushing the boundary in terms of subnational EITI and using some of the data on direct taxes and employment to have some of these conversations, but to also make sure the districts have reliable data to be able to plan their budgets better in the medium term. So I'll, I'll stop there and the, uh, I hope to have about three questions in one round and then we can, we can take it on from there. Thank you very much for your presentations. I would like to push you a bit forward because I feel that most of the things that we've heard, not just in this panel, but in other panels, are the kind of initiatives that would be good also for a high price time. Diversification, uh, more democracy, even the subnational fund idea. So what's, what's new now, besides the palliatives that are needed for the compensating the fiscal impact that Vasha just mentioned? What should be the new policy in the new low prices? Thank you. Additional questions? Miles? Thank you. Miles Litvinoff, uh, Publish What You Pay UK, and I'm also on the UK EITI multi-stakeholder group. Um, to what extent at the sub-national level is um, expatriation of profits by the extractive companies a concern, and is there pressure to address this? I'm thinking of the uh, uh, mention in the Africa Progress Panel report on extractives identifying uh, company ex uh, expatriation of profits as the major factor in illicit financial flows. To what extent is that a concern at subnational levels? Thank you. Can I? Sorry. Hello. Sorry, Gavin Heyman from the Open Contracting Partnership. Um, so it wasn't about particularly commodity price volatility, but it was just about um, the spending arrangements. So I know, for example, in South Sudan, um, where there is an attempt to put in a formula for subnational revenue flows, um, but it goes through a very different spending channel from normal government spending, which is actually quite a corruption risk because it's not subject to whatever limited oversight there is nationally. And so I just wondered if you might say about um, the actual flows and how they're managed, and do you see that as a risk and a challenge or not? So thank you. So the question is, there is a separate mechanism for resource revenue sharing in South Sudan, and do you think that allows for additional channels for corruption? Yeah, exactly. It's simply, is it subject to ha what sort of oversight procedures? Because if you're giving it at a local level, it's like how do you sort of manage and govern those to make sure the sort of money is being properly kind of scrutinized? Uh, perhaps we'll take one more yep. question and then move on. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm Satya Yuda. I'm representing the area where actually uh, Aji Satria just explain it because I, my district is from Bujunagoro. And uh, I'd like to, uh, to ask both uh, Selu and as well as uh, Aji Satria with regard to transparency because I like the way you build the capacity locally. And uh, in return, it's going to create the uh, high expectation from the people down in, at the local. While the endorsement from the center is quite important. So how do you lies between the local to the center in, in terms of the uh, transparency on the revenue sharing? What I do understand when you explain, when you create uh, transparency at the local, where the people expect, will expect more than the actually they receive, then there will be a creating a problem. This is one, 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 uh, one aspect. The other aspect is there is another group as well, probably at the local level, that also trying to influence people over there, you know, using the different scheme of the uh, revenue sharing, for instance. So there will be a competition between one group to another group. So how do you tackle and anticipate? 
I think I think we will stop there. I think we have a rich set of questions here, um, um, starting with the idea of what's so different in a low commodity environment. Um, is there anyone who would volunteer to take that on? Fialo? Um I think the stuff that we discuss is more of really preparation when we reach a low commodity environment, but I would like to take it a little further and discuss it more on a hypothetical level than actual practice, because in the Philippines we're not, as I said, we're not very affected. But I would like to look at fiscal policy more as a tool in addressing low prices of, of commodities. So for example, um, in, in an area where you have strong linkages between upstream and downstream, and you actually have lots of industries dependent on mining at the local level, low price will have a huge impact on employment. And I think in that case, there's no hard rule on whether to impose high taxes or low taxes on companies. Um, if you have uh, very strong linkages, I think it will be strategic for government to actually reduce tax that they're collecting and peg the tax on the price at the na international level so that we can continue to encourage companies to operate because there are other industries dependent on the mining company. But on the other hand, if the mining company is, is not linked, like in the case of the Philippines, we don't have downstream, very small upstream industry, very limited employment. So there's the only benefit that we're actually getting from mining is the taxation. And the strategy that we're doing in the Philippines is actually wrong. Having very small taxes and thinking that, that encouraging business to operate will actually have significant impact at the local level is actually not happening. So I guess it's, it's not a hard rule on whether to give, to impose high tax or low tax, but it can be a tool in the long run depending on the context at the local level. Jennifer, did you have to say on that? One time, sir. Yeah. Uh, um, just, just one by one. Do, do we need to answer all the questions? Um, uh, I was hoping Zainab could respond to that question, and then we can move on to the question specific okay. to Indonesia for Aji to respond to. Okay. okay. Um, what is, what is different and what can we do better? What is different now is that with the fall in prices, of course revenue is, has, uh, is, is uh, very much reduced, both at the federal and, as well as the state levels. And for us, at least in Nigeria, we, this is a very good opportunity because we have a new government that is faced with this problem that will have no choice but to concentrate on uh, options to the revenue from the from the center. The revenue sharing formula in Nigeria has worked to the extent as it is defined in the constitution, but it has also been the cause of the problem because every month you know that you're going to get this amount from the center and therefore you have no incentive to do anything else. So you just wait when the month ends, you go to Abuja and it's shared and you, you have a credit in your account. And what that did is to make, um, to make the states uh, laid back and not push to do anything. And on the other hand also, it makes the citizens even more laid back because citizens are not paying taxes, the states are not pushing them to pay taxes and therefore they are not looking at how the monies have been spent. So when a, when a local government chairman brings a road to your district, you, the, state, the citizens feel as if he's doing them a favor, whereas he's just carrying out the responsibility that he's supposed to carry out. They're not asking, was I supposed to get a five kilometer road or a 20 kilometer road? They're not asking those, those, uh, those questions. Um, there is an opportunity for the states at this time to look internally, look inwards uh, to how they can operate beyond what is coming at the, at the center. Can you, can you, that's a good segue to the, the other question we had on having a, the kind of governance framework that works best to ensure there is least corruption in a revenue sharing mechanism, given the experience with the excess crude account. Do you, would you say which was initially could have functioned as a way to stabilize revenues flowing to state governments? Would you say in hindsight or even moving forward, the way a revenue sharing mechanism could be designed? Are there specific mechanisms that have to be in place to ensure it's well, not? Well, my view personally is that there is no, nothing wrong with the revenue sharing formula. It's worked and it's working. 
What is, what is uh, missing is the, uh, the discipline in managing the, the revenues that is shared at the center. And also because the sharing is assured or used to be assured, then there was no incentive to do anything um, else at the, at the state level. Only Lagos State in our country has IGRs that is almost four times over what they get from the center. And it is so because Lagos State is a commercial center and they made a special effort to concentrate on collecting taxes. There's nothing you do in Lagos, whether it's you're looking for admission for your child for school or you're trying to register for land, at every point they're asking you for your uh, evidence of your tax payment. So citizens there um, now are at the point that people actually walk to the tax office and say, I want to pay my tax, because they see a lot of infrastructure being rolled out, a lot of changes and improvements in the, in, in the state. There is a need to strengthen the participation of citizens in bringing about accountability at the state level so that uh, the, 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 the governors or the state operation is put on their toes to manage the resources uh, adequately. And finally, the question on um, the role of national government and um, some of the challenges with setting up a subnational fund in Bojanego, Aji. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I once I once talked to a, uh, an official from the Ministry of Finance, and uh, he said that he did not he did not want to publish the the forecasts on or also the data on the production of the oil production at the national level too soon because if it's too soon then it would incentivize the subnational government to to make a, a, a wasteful and excessive projection of their subnational budget i mean i, I think it, it's it's kind of it's kind of a i did not understand it but it's 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 kind of it's kind of uh, reflecting the the exactly what Pak Satria mentioned that sometimes transparency would then in incentivize uh, some subnational governments to do some perverse activities. But of course, transparency is something that is important and something that needs to be uh, set up. But uh, I think uh, in my personal opinion, what, what, what we need is a, a different level of, of information classification and which information should be distributed to all citizens and which information should be distributed to uh, to the subnational governments and which information should be distributed to uh, a small member of the of the subnational governments for example because only then with with uh, with a classification or information that it can be manage uh, the, the the flow the structure and also the the sensitivity of the information in that respect and also uh, uh, I think we, an, another issue on the expatriation of profit, perhaps. Uh, I, I guess in Indonesia there is no, uh, there's no problem with expatriation of profit at the, at the subnational level because it, it belongs in the, in the central government. But there is also some regulation on local content which, uh, which imposes local subnational government to as impose uh, companies, mining companies, to spend their, their profit and, and some uh, local project and also procure from, from local sources. So that would be some of the issue. But I, I don't think that is uh, something that is uh, important in, in Indonesia. And also because some because this is a unitary country and some is still controlled by the central government, like for example, the, the control of corruption. Corruption is basically uh, as a, as, a, as a law enforcement activities, as a in criminal investigation, and all uh, law enforcement and all, all criminal investigation activities are still retained by the central government. So in that sense, it provides a checks and balance from the central government and the local government because although the money is dispersed to the subnational level and they have a somewhat a freedom and discretion to, to distribute and spend that money, but the central government still has the control over the supervision through the uh, prosecution activities, uh, corruption, and also they also retain this uh, authority to audit financially, audit the the, the revenue sharing, and that that is why it's uh, there still need a uh, mechanism of control from the central government. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to answer in Spanish, and Claudia will uh, help me to translate. My apologies. 
cuatro puntos para destacar en mi respuesta. Eh, en primer lugar, eh, creo que el gobierno, los gobiernos locales no pueden enfrentar solos eh, la situación de baja de precios y tienen que establecer una relación más armónica con el gobierno nacional para enfrentar juntos esta situación. So his response is consistent of four points. First, that local governments uh, cannot face this, this new situation of lower prices by themselves. They, they need to have a, a process of uh, joining forces with the central government. En segundo lugar, eh, una salida podría ser el, el incremento de los impuestos locales, pero como ya lo señalé, eso genera una uh, respuesta contraria de las compañías. Uh, another response could be to strengthen uh, local tax collection uh, capabilities, but this generates a negative response from companies at the local level. Además, eh, los impuestos dependen de la dinámica económica local. Por lo tanto, una política fundamental es estimular la economía local a través de procesos de diversificación productiva. And also local tax collection depends on the actual economic uh, um, activity at the local level, so they need, there needs to be process to strengthen the, the, econ the local economies through diversification processes. El tercer punto es que hay que emprender una muy fuerte lucha contra la corrupción en el gasto público a nivel local. And there also needs to be a, a very hard struggle against corruption at the local level. Y por eso nosotros estamos proponiendo en Colombia eh, que la iniciativa de transparencia de las industrias extractivas tenga un componente fuerte subnacional. That's why they are pushing in Colombia for the EITI to have a very strong local component. Eh, y finalmente, eh, me parece que hay que eh, superar eh, el modelo de economía de enclave que las economías, que las grandes empresas han impuesto eh, en el, la explotación de los recursos naturales. And finally, he thinks that they have to overcome the model of, of an enclave uh, structure that companies, that mining companies have set up at the local level. Las empresas deben asumir una responsabilidad con respecto al desarrollo del territorio y por eso en mi presentación hablé de la importancia de construir acuerdos locales, acuerdos de gobernanza del territorio en los que diferentes actores puedan eh, construir visiones conjuntas de territorio y asignar roles al, a las compañías. So, uh, companies have to, to take on the responsibility of uh, developing the local economy and that's why in his presentation he uh, highlighted the importance of having uh, collaborative and multi-stakeholder uh, multi processes at the local level uh, to promote the development of, of these areas. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Laura. May I, may I add something on transparency and local governments and the transfer? Mm -hmm. I, was, um, I was thinking about the, the question on transparency and uh, setting high expectation at the local level given the high disclosure at the national level. I, I don't think it's an issue. I think uh, expectation is very good when you have it at the local level. I think local governments should be entitled for predictability in terms of income, especially in the context of a decentralized system because you're also expecting them to provide social services. Um, and I think that's the value that um, subnational uh, transparency and EITI ha have added. You're empowering local governments to actually be more responsible in terms of their finances. Um, with regard to corruption, I don't think it's associated with fiscal transfers. It's not fiscal transfers that's causing corruption at the local level. I think it's the lack of accountability. Um, it doesn't mean that if we remove uh, transfers from the national to the local that corruption will disappear. Corruption is there because there's no mechanism to actually make local governments account how they're spending the money and there are no mechanisms for the citizen to actually monitor how governments are spending. So there's no relationship between transfer and and um, corruption at the local level. In terms of the issue on uh, profit uh, expatriation, it's not yet an issue at the local level because I think it requires high level of uh, capacity to analyze finance, finances of mining companies. But if you actually see how um, expatriation of profit in other countries are affecting the total government take, I think it's gonna be an issue. At the national level, we're looking at it and we're trying to legislate policy on thin capitalization um, 
not, not allowing companies to actually reimburse or include as, as part of your operating cost interest expense so that they would stop borrowing and actually reinvest the money that they get from profit. In such a way, you'll be encouraging the reinvestment of earnings from mining instead of taking out of the country. Thanks, Yellow. Um, Zena, can you tell us more about the excess crude account? Well, the excess crude account was meant to receive um, revenues that is over and above the actual price realized above the, the national budget. It worked at the beginning and it's still working, but it has not been managed well. It was meant to be to fund the Severn Wealth Fund as well as cover deficits when they occur on a monthly basis. But what has happened is there was a continuous dip into that pool and it's, it, it was depleted from the levels, uh, the highest level that we had around uh, 2010. And also there wasn't um, the discipline of continuing to to put the excess in that in that uh, specific account, so it is still uh, that we still have some funds in the excess crude account. It is still currently being used to um, bridge the the gap, and that's why the sharing is still continuing in the ratio in which I, I had explained earlier on. But it will get to the point when it's completely finished, and the. Uh, challenge would be that the sharing formula as provided in the Constitution cannot be, cannot be uh, completely adhered to. And the states will therefore, at that time, now have to find ways internally how they can, how they can uh, operate. And there was also, I just want to also add on the question on to what extent the expatriation of profit affects subnational levels. To us, uh, because the funds go to the center, and it's shared, it also affects the subnational level. Um, companies that operate in Nigeria have been found in quite a number of instances of, um, there's no difficulty in expatriation, they can uh, transfer their funds freely, but there's also a lot of practices uh, in terms of uh, transfer pricing that has been discovered to the extent that the tax uh, authority has had to put a new regulation in place to monitor transfer pricing. And once um, a company is able to escape paying the taxes that it's supposed to pay and move some of its, uh, the benefit of the tax to another uh, jurisdiction, it means less is coming to the, to the center and therefore the subnational governments also get less in the process. Um, do we have time for maybe a couple more questions? Please go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Jean-Pierre from DRC. My question was to the economist uh, Cello Manu. Uh, in terms of, uh, can you explore your recommendation uh, to subnational, as a subnational response for this local uh, trust fund that you mm -hmm. talked about? Uh, how can uh, how can it be sustainable? In the case of Nigeria, states have been found mismanaging the fund, uh, and they end up asking for bailout. I'm not saying well, you, 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 if you do not have uh, the correct uh, regulatory frame. What I'm saying here, as an economist myself. Uh, how do you uh, invest that fund? And if you do invest it badly, that's mismanagement. Uh, and only central government has, is a sovereign, you know, and that's why they are asking probably, yes, if there's surplus, put it back to us, and we can put it in the national market. If there's a default, I'm not going to ask a subnational uh, uh, authority to kind of uh, uh, mitigate for that. So I wanted you to explore, uh, that was my question, and uh, seeing the other cases, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to answer at a more theoretical level because we haven't really practiced it in the Philippines. We are advocating it. Um, what I've observed between the dynamic at uh, national and local level is that the national government tends to be very paternalistic. 
very, very careful in trusting local governments to actually manage funds. That's why I, that's the, why I think the reason why if you're not able to spend the money, give it back to us. And that's the, that's the policy now. And it's very difficult because the law is very clear in terms of what the local government share is. So when you have um, huge income from mining, they actually get huge money, but there's no strategy on how to spend it. So in one year, you can actually see local government spending money on computers, even if they don't need it, vehicles, cell phones, and increase in salary of staff, which is what you see at the national level. So what I'm hoping to see is to give local governments flexibility in terms of creating separate fund and keep it as savings. But then the problem that, that, that you're raising is very valid in terms of really monitoring and making sure that the money is spent properly. And I think a good strategy there would be to actually use a multi-stakeholder group as a venue to monitor how the money is being spent and how it's being invested. I haven't seen a local government yet given a power to actually invest. In the Philippines now, we're allowing them to borrow money, which is just a recent innovation before they are not allowed to borrow money. They have to get the permission of the national government, and the national government guarantees it. But now that they're given a little more flexibility in terms of fiscal policy, I think it's also possible, as long as there's um, accountability mechanism to make sure that the funds in the, the trust is monitored. But um, going back to some of the questions we were discussing in earlier sessions on the challenges with, with sustaining a fund at the national level, do you see, do you see any benefits? I mean, we, we are aware of all the challenges and additional challenges at the subnational level, but is there anything positive going for setting up a fund at the local level? Because for me, I see an additional, the, the, the national government as an additional external agent that one needs to take into consideration when setting up a fund at the local level, which only um, complicates the, the regulatory framework further, right? Mm. Does Aji and Zialo okay. have anything more to add to? Sure. Yeah, I think the issue, the, the first issue is entitlement, whether the local government, the subnational government is entitled to that money. <laughs> and which they do according to the revenue sharing or whatever amendment to that revenue sharing agreement, uh, arrangement. But also the, the other question is the capacity and whether, whether the local government, even if they're entitled to that, to that some portion of that revenue, whether they have the capacity to actually manage and save the fund. And that is also the issue that we are currently uh, facing uh, on the project uh, that we're currently working on. Because the, uh, there, there's an idea that this, this uh, local government should, should establish a new institution, and this new institution is the one that is going to manage this subnational natural resource fund. But uh, yeah, setting up an institution requires an, an investment in time and resources and, and, and money, and also uh, yeah, human resources, which can be problematic if, if, it, if it's not prepared accordingly. So one of the, one of the key uh, recommendation that uh, we and NRGI prepare is that, that this fund, although it's going to belong to the subnational government, should be, should be managed by a more rep reputable institution that already used to uh, managing this, this kind of fund, which is, uh, I can, it can be either a, a, a national state-owned companies, for example. So uh, that, that is one thing, but this is, we, we are currently preparing this in the absence of a national regulatory framework. Uh, I think uh, we, already, we also discussed this issue with some of the experts, uh, mostly here, uh, Indonesian experts that are here in this room. And uh, I think that the, the, the most appropriate way to, to proceed with this subnational resource, natural resource fund is to have a, a national regulatory framework uh, uh, a guidelines at the national level, also all the formula, all the institution, all the structure that is set out by the national government. Although, although perhaps later on the the actual implementation can be can be done by the subnational government, but it still needs uh, a national regulatory framework to ensure its sustainability, as you mentioned, and also to to also to Im to uh, incentivize other uh, subnational governments to actually want to do this. Because at this moment, this is this is not something that is a priority to subnational governments. This is this is even I think this is the, the least priority of subnational governments to set up a natural resource fund, because they still need to want to ex expedite their development uh, activities. So I think at the end of the day, it's uh, uh, yeah, especially in a unitary country like Indonesia, that is not a federal country, the the importance of national 
regulatory oversight and framework is, is, is even more important. Thank you so much. And I think we'll close there. Thank you so much to our panelists for such interesting and distinguished presentations. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.